Welcome back, everyone, to Electronics with Python and the Microbit. That's AKA What's a Microcontroller with Python on the Microbit. This is workshop day two, October 26th, 2022. Um, if you're uh, watching this on YouTube later, uh, right below the video, there will be a link to the slideshow. You may need to click show more to be able to see it. And uh, I'll go ahead and paste in the um, a link to the slideshow in case you want to have it open on the side. There we go. Okay, so this is the slightly revised schedule. I, I kind of um, kind of revise it based on um, you know, the, the progress we we actually make. I'm I'm still trying to fine tune this so that it's um so that it can be the same every time. Um so for homework uh between Monday and today, we had you build and test a light. We actually, yeah, we had you build and test a light and then uh build a bunch of LEDs and a couple of push buttons. So Couple, three light circuits, two push buttons. Um, so today, what we're going to do is, is uh, like I did on on Monday, I'm going to uh, go through the homework as quickly as I can, and also hopefully um, get some questions from you that that I can answer uh, about the homework. Um, one of the reasons that I wanted to have you do the build and test a light was just to kind of uh, have the student experience. And I'll talk a little bit more about that momentarily. Um, we'll also be talking about circuit measurements. Now, this is something that differentiates this pre-engineering curriculum from other STEM types of electronics uh, kits and lessons in that um, we actually learn how to take circuit measurements, which is one of the things that I've noticed that students who just do the here's how to connect it, isn't this great uh, kind of electronics lessons? Well, you know, when, when it comes time to invent, uh, one of the places they end up getting stuck is for lack of the ability to ability to and experience with uh, measuring their circuits. Um, Okay, so we're also um, the applications du jour are going to be the lights and the um, push buttons that we've built. Uh, we'll also talk about the various concepts that relate to on off signals to analog and digital and digital to analog conversion, uh, and also some of the um, scripting concepts that go into making those apps work. Um, in addition, we'll be measuring what's going on while certain light and button reading apps are running at the tail end. Uh, for homework, we're going to have you add a servo and a potentiometer um, to the circuit you already have. And with that, I'm going to back up a little ways. This, this might look a little different from where we left off because I adjusted it. Um, here is a screen capture of the homework that uh, that went out after Monday's session. And so there was an all points bulletin of, hey, so you have a whole bunch of resistors with the color codes, red, red, brown, gold, uh, red, red, brown, gold, that's uh, two, 220 ohms. I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. Um, and they come in two different sizes. and. Uh, the, the longer size was taped together, and we have um, some fairly long distances to span with those resistors. So I just wanted to give you all a heads up. Hey, you know, if you find the loose ones in your kit, well, they might not span these distances, but these other ones definitely will. Um, so another thing I did was this, this was the part right here in the homework where you were inside the student workbook part of it and um, follow, you know, reading the explanations, following the checklist instructions. And granted, it's, it's a very, um, you know, given that your teachers and it's the week, I tried to really minimize as much as I could uh, the amount of time this took. So I, I was very selective with what I grabbed. 
But um, one thing about this is that these first four activities come from one chapter, or these first four section, three sections, pardon me, the first three sections of activities here come from one chapter and activity. This fourth one comes from a different chapter and a different activity. Uh, likewise, these first two um, read it just to see what the students end up learning after they try stuff out are from the building your first circuit. And this last one is how it works is from script, scripts and tests. And so really what that homework would have looked like if I'd have done it right, just to have you know where everything fell uh, chapter and activity wise, it would have looked like this. And I will probably send out this format for the homework for Friday. So please try not to worry if it looks really long because you don't have to read this entire, oh, whoopsie. You don't have to read this entire chapter right here, not even necessarily the entire activity, just focus on the, the sections that are there. So again, the homework for Friday, you might see a really long list, but just focus on the sections. It should go by really quickly as I hope this set of sections did go by really quickly for you. Um, and so, so this is the first, um, these are the sections from the first chapter, the try it stuff and the read it and learn related to what you just tried. And then of course, that's the same thing over here in electrical measurements. And one of the things that was really important, I feel is that you got a chance to try out some of the electrical measurements. Um, what I'm going to do is talk about the remaining electrical measurements chapter. There's a lot to do there. We could really stretch out this course over quite a few hours if we were to do all of those together. So you got to try one type of electrical measurement and I'll show you some of the others that are in that chapter. Um, another thing was for building, uh, we had you build two chapters worth of circuits here. These three lights were built one at a time in the LED lights chapter. And along the way we did and learned a lot of stuff, which we'll see today. And uh, then the second chapter was the push buttons. And likewise, there are a lot of, of the things that are added to the push buttons in terms of concepts and you know different applications to make it fun as well. So we had you build this so that we can kind of breeze through two more chapters. So there's going to be one chapter, which is the measurements chapter, which you got to try measuring voltage in electrical measurements. And then, um, and then the two more chapters are the lights and the buttons. And to that end, we talked about how there's a push button housing here. And uh, these are, this is what a close up of the push button in your kit. And if you look at it carefully, you'll notice that the legs come out of the housing um, on a particular side. And so before inserting the push buttons into the breadboard, the important thing was to make sure that the legs were coming out of both sides of the housing before lining them up with the holes down there. Uh, if you turn this 90 degrees, it doesn't work right. If you turn it 180, it works fine again. Um, so that, that was the homework and hopefully we all have this ready to go. Um, I'd also like you to uh, plug in your, uh, plug your micro bit and prototyping set up here into your USB. And um, while I'm talking a little bit more and, and try to get your, uh, your python.microbit.org editor all set and ready so that we can start loading scripts into it. Uh, and then this was the schematic. Since we haven't talked about schematics yet, uh, I'm just going to breeze, breeze past it and hope to remember to look at it later. Um, okay, so then we start today. So um, I'll skip forward now to um, the outline of today, which is three slides of links. 
And part of the reason for this is because anybody who um, might not have been able to make it to this session and wants to stay caught up for Friday, uh, I'm going to do my best to follow the links from these pages. But periodically, I, I will also show you where these things live, uh, starting at learn.parallax.com. Um, one of the follow-ups, uh, so yesterday, or pardon me, Monday, I could not find the picture of the breadboard with the adhesive backing removed. And it turned out that it was in breadboard setup and testing in try this. I thought it was in how it works, um, but instead it was in the did you know part of probing with the, you know, probing the breadboard to see about continuity. Um, and so here is a picture of the breadboard. And so each of these little um, short pieces of metal here is actually five little clips, all connected by metallic underneath, because we're looking at the bottom of it here. And so when you push a wire into one of these sockets, you're actually pushing two little metal fingers apart. And those fingers are pressing on the edge of, or, you know, yeah, on the edge of the wire as you insert it into the breadboard socket. Um, then we also have the, the plus and minus columns where, uh, where you have, so the, the, those were the, breadboard rows that we were just talking about. And now we'll talk about the breadboard columns, the vertical ones. And so those have a long interconnected set of, um, they're still groups of five sockets, but because they're of the fact that there's metal connecting all these groups of five, as opposed to no metal, uh, these, these, each one of these groups of five are in plastic, but it's cheapest for the manufacturer to say, oh, well, we just make one group of five sockets and we either cut them apart to put them in this little, you know, housing here, or we don't cut them apart and we have them nice and long so that, so that we can make the bus strip. So this is the terminal strip here with all the little rows of five. And then these are the bus strips with these columns of, I don't know how many, um, 25 actually sockets, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. So this is definitely there to help your students kind of uh, get the idea reinforced of, of how and why uh, the connections are happening. Um, any questions before I continue? Okay, as always, shout them out uh, if they come to mind or chat them. And Stephanie, uh, I don't notice the chats much, but <laughs> Stephanie usually helps me out with that. <laughs> There's just a comment from Sylvie that she has a clear plastic breadboard for the students to compare with theirs to see where the connections are. Oh, that's really cool, Sylvie. Yes, we used to have clear, pla uh, clear and translucent plastic breadboards. We don't anymore, unfortunately, but that's a good, great tip. So if you see any of those on Amazon, um, go ahead and get one. Uh, it, it, it does potentially uh, allow one of these nice breadboards not to be sacrificed <laughs> for, the, for the actual in-person uh, look at that. Um, learning schematics, uh, okay. So a little bit of learning schematics happened in in the chapter where we were putting things together because we built a circuit. And so the first part of learning schematics, the first installment of learning schematics was basically, hey, each of these is a part. And each of those parts has a schematic symbol. And uh, as you build those parts, well, I just happened to have landed on it. Well, now I'm going to open this up in a uh, in the MP4. All right. So we have the parts right here, and as the students place the parts, 
or as they see the parts being placed, the first one that gets placed is just simply a lead from ground to a row. And so I showed, hey, look, we have a ground connection as part of our schematic. And then moving forward, the next thing to be placed is the LED, the light emitting diode. And so what we see is, okay, well, here it is. And here it appeared on the schematic. Moving forward, when we put the resistor in the uh, in a row in the terminal strip, we have the resistor sticking up into space. And in the schematic, we also have the resistor sticking up into space. And then last but not least, the resistor is connected to the 3.3 volt side, whereas the, uh, the ground or zero volt side was down at the bottom here with the black wire. And so this is a complete circuit that if you apply 3.3 volt electrical pressure, the light will come on. And then um, just to help out, we also magnify it so that everybody can get a look at exactly which sockets the wires are and leads are going into. And remember, uh, and it's it's called out in the um, in the student workbook, the longer lead of the light emitting diode goes on the left side for these circuits because it's a one-way valve. Current will go through this way and the light will come on. If you were to pull it out and give it a half turn and plug it back in, no current would flow. The light would not go on because the one-way valve is the wrong way. And um, then what you did at home was plug in the USB cable and make sure that the light came on, disconnect it, and then the light turns off. There's not even a script um, for that. And so here I have um, that, uh, that circuit. And basically, we don't need the, the measuring probes. I have to unfreeze this and then go through and mute my own image to not overwhelm the, uh, where is it? Stop video. There we go. OK. All right, so here is the first one. Now, you guys have a bunch of lights built, so don't disconnect the, or you know, don't go back to this. Just leave it, leave your stuff as is. Um, and uh, so note that um, that we have the light on, and I can I can unplug it and turn the light off, or or basically just you know float any of these wires, and the light will go off, which kind of uh, helps understand understanding that, hey, this is a circuit and it, every single little piece of it needs to be um, correct for it, for it to work, for it to conduct electricity. Now, uh, then uh, I was talking about that we had um, in the homework, we had stuff from two different chapters. So looking at the next chapter, we have our first, you know, electrical measurements, and it's the first breadboard circuit. And we have some script and we have a script and some tests. And that script and tests uh, I'm going to freeze this. OK, that script and tests. Is right here, and so it's it's measure volts with cyberscope, and and what you did was you uh, right clicked and selected save link as, and then um, and then that goes into your downloads, save, and uh, so here here it is in your downloads. And um, for this one, since it's pre-written, you can actually just drag and drop it from the from where it appears in the downloads ribbon here, and just drop it into um, the Python editor, and then you're ready to go. Just hit connect, choose your micro bit, and then hit flash. And since we're using the cyberscope here, we want to disconnect. 
And next up, you can go to uh, cyberscope.parallax.com. Once you get here, hit connect, choose the micro bit again. And right now, I have a whopping roughly zero volts measured. And the reason is because my probes are off in the middle of nowhere. Okay, so here are my probes. And what the, um, what the activity guided, the, the red checklist instructions, the step-by-step -step stuff, guided us through taking our probes and measuring, first of all, the voltage across the circuit, the total circuit, which is roughly 3.3 volts. Okay, and then what, what the student workbook guided them through was, all right, hey, you guys, let's measure the voltage just across the LED light. So now, uh, So now I have my probes across just the light and we're seeing about 1.8, 1.9 volts. Uh, and then the students next, and I might've gotten this in reverse act order actually, I don't remember whether they measured the resistor or the light first, but, um, but then we measured the voltage across these two ends of the resistor. Um, let's see here, looking for a pointer. Okay, so basically, um, here's one end of the resistor and we're in the same column. And then here's the other end of the resistor and we're in the same row here. And so we're seeing roughly 1.3 volts across uh, the resistor. and then 1.9 volts um, across the LED. And then 3.3 volts, I just broke this wire somehow, but it was, uh, it, should, it should add up to 3.3. We're about 1.1 volt off, which is fine. We can write that off to, uh, you know, basically measurement error. And, um, and so that's, that's the lesson. And uh, let's see if I can find a replacement lead. There we go. So we've got 3.3 and we've got I like that 1.05. That's kind of what I was expecting to see. Yeah. So, or, oh, pardon me, 1.3. And then two. There we go. So there's two volts and 1.3 volts, and that adds up to 3.3 volts. So there is an example of something that the students go through as one of the activities in the electrical measurements, resuming with that first breadboard circuit that we built earlier. Now, also uh, what I wanna mention is that um, going back to the first breadboard circuit, so we're back in breadboard setup and testing here. Uh, here is, and there's a, so they, the students try the things out and then after they've tried it, there is a how it works. So, so they get their hands on out of the way. And then there's some information about, hey, here's a, a light emitting diode, an LED. Here's how the um, anode and cathode in the uh, schematic symbol correspond to the long and short leads on the actual part itself. And then we explain a resistor and how it resists the flow of current and how um, uh, but, but we stop there because reading these color bands comes on the next page. Uh, but one thing, um, I also did was I redrew the schematic in a way that more precisely corresponds to 
the physical wiring they did to help them see one that schematics are kind of malleable uh, in the in the way they might be arranged, and then two, you know, here is the direct relationship. You know, the 3.3 volt rail, the 220 ohm resistor right here, the LED with its anode over here, its cathode over here, longer pin, um, and then the uh, the connection to ground. So, so these again are things that we're trying to build in to help get the idea across about the relationship between schematics and actual circuits. Moving on, we have um, resistor color codes. And this is where uh, the students learn that this is one of the resistor color coding systems that's out there. And in this particular system, uh, each stripe corresponds with a digit. And the first two stripes correspond with the first two digits in the resistor's value. And then the third stripe uh, corresponds with the number of zeros to append, although uh, oftentimes it's also introduced as the power of 10 to multiply your first two digits by. So in this case, 22 plus one zero would be 220, or 22 times 10 to the one, would be 22 times 10. And again, we get to 220 as our final value. So um, yeah, I really like to just, you know, call this the number of zeros to add. It makes it much simpler. And then the gold gold band could also be silver. Um, gold is 5% ac accuracy and silver is 10%. And then no stripe is 25%. And so this is a lesson on how to read resistor bands. Now, um, there's also a try this, more hands-on stuff. Uh, what they do is they take out this resistor and replace it with a higher resistor value. Well, a resistor resists current that was introduced earlier. So a higher resistance is going to resist current more. And it turns out that the light becomes significantly dimmer. Then when they take out the, the larger resistor, it's a uh, uh, brown, black, red, which is 10 or which is one kilo ohm or 1000 ohms. So then they put back a value that's a quarter of that or a resistor that's a quarter of that value. And we're back to the brightness that we started with. Now, I mentioned on Monday that there's review and practice on all these. And so here we have um, some challenges on, you know, what can you build with your breadboard? And uh, then we also have some solutions to those challenges. Okay, so that that concludes, um, or well, that's that catches us up. That goes through the homework. Now, uh, as I was going through that, did any questions come to mind, or did you have any questions as you were going through that student homework, or was it all? Did it all look okay and <laughs> fine, and the explanations work, and we can just move on? <laughs> okay, I will take silence as assent, and thank Wait, you for that. I have one question. It never occurred to me. Uh -huh. But I ask anyways. So okay. those resistors, they have the stripes, right? Yes. Does it matter if you, you flip? It does not matter. And so it doesn't matter um, if the, the way we put the register connected is different from the, the order of the cutter or in the picture. Okay. So if you were to connect this resistor. Right now it's showing red, red, brown, gold. If you unplugged it, gave it a half turn and mm. so that it showed gold, brown, red, red. The only difference is that it would be more difficult to read from oh. left to right. Okay. Um, and that's basically it. Uh, a resistor resists the flow of current, but it resists it in either direction. Unlike the, um, unlike the LED, which is bi-directional. And um, I want to say that I have that in here as well. Right there, you have it in the resistors plug in either way. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Ari. I, you were ahead of me by about yeah, three yeah, lines. So, uh, <laughs> I, I have to confess, I'm a visual learner. I usually skip <laughs> the text. 
unless yep. it doesn't work and then I start reading the text. So maybe that's why I skipped it. Thank you. Well, well and that's another reason that we have questions, exercises and projects in the homework is to direct students back to look at look at or possibly for specifics. I'm the same way. Um, so, yep. OK, good. And let's see. So thank you for that question. Um, it was it was good to verify that it's all there. Uh, I was kind of sweating for a minute, wondering if I'd have to say, okay, well, that's a great question and we'll have to add the answer to the text. <laughs> um, so that was measure voltage. Okay, so I'm gonna go quickly through the rest of them just so that you know what's there. And um, I'm also gonna point out um, what I consider to be a few important points along the way. So starting with measure resistance, um, the, the, the cover page just talks about um, some of the, you know, it explains conceptually, reiterates what resistance is it, that, that had already been talked about once. Um, and then we list the, 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 the parts that the students are going to need. And um, as you can see, there's a extra three pin header required for these measurements. And it's because the, the circuit to, um, to take the measurements uh, will leave the other two three pin headers in there. But, um, and yeah, actually I misspoke. There are two additional three pin headers that are added um, for the resistance measurement. And so they'll have to add the two three pin headers, a wire and a particular resistor. When we come back around, I'll remember what it is. It's either one or 2K, 2K, red, black, red. So they have to add a resistor and the, um, and that's again, why we have the, um, the MP4 here so that we can go through and pause at each step. So, uh, and again, we have the, uh, the schematic populating itself so that they can see um, another schematic representation to what gets built. And so here we have uh, the actual circuit. There's a, a jumper wire that goes to P1 and then, um, well, suffice to say, if you want to measure resistance, or if the students want to be able to measure resistance correctly, they'll have to follow this very carefully. And once they get that built up, they'll add the, uh, so that's why we magnify it so they can get a really good look, make sure that everything's plugged into the right spot. And then we add the probes. And that's the end of that. Now, once the resistor probes or the resistance measuring circuit is set up. The next thing we do is the script and tests. And so this is, there's going to be another hex file that they download and, and they'll use the cyberscope. Uh, and then what they'll have to do is pluck a resistor out of the circuit because you cannot measure resistors inside the circuit. I had a uh, shiny new, uh, just graduated from engineering school um, uh, person that I was helping because they were having some difficulties getting the correct resistor measurements. And the reason they were having those difficulties was because they had not taken the resistor out of the circuit. And that's kind of a cardinal rule of resistance measurements is that um, except for a very few special cases, you cannot measure a resistor while it's inside the circuit. You have to remove it before you measure it. So the chapter makes a big deal out of that, both in the text and in the procedure that you go through where you set your, your clips down and then you put the resistor in and then you take a look at the, uh, no, it doesn't show the cyber, ah, there's the cyberscope. So then you get to see um, and here we have 218 omega is for ohms. And so this is a within 218 is certainly within 5% of 220. It could be off by 11 ohms in either direction. 
uh, five percent of two twenty is going to be eleven if you run it through a calculator. So remember that in order to measure resistance, we can't just run the program. The circuit needs to be modified so that 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 you can measure resistance, and then also students have to remove the device under test, in this case, the resistor from the circuit in order to measure its resistance and then put it back in after it's me been measured. All right. Ah, yes. Um, so in terms of how it works, we introduce um, the concept of We have a two kilo ohm resistor that was part of the resistance measuring circuit. And um, at the end of the day, when you were connecting your probes to measure that circuit, um, what you ended up with was two resistors end to end. And depending on the value of this resistor, it would affect the voltage right here because remember, uh, voltages have to add up to the total supply voltage. And that voltage can be measured, and then you can go through some math and then figure out what the resulting uh, resistance is. And so here we have, try this, and we're measuring a different resistor again. And this time it's that 1K resistor, the brown, black, red from earlier. And here we are, almost one kilo ohm. Also for basic electronics, um, some interesting things that, cause I've, I remember students ran into this where they didn't have the res right resistor value for their invention and they felt stuck. Well, one thing you can do is connect resistors end to end. That's uh, in electronics speak, that's in series, connecting them in series. And the equivalent resistance is just simply adding them together. And even if you have three resistors, you're still just adding their values together and measuring the result. Now, there's also a such thing as connecting them side by side or in parallel. Now, uh, when you have it in parallel, it's a little bit more complicated. You have to take one over each of the parallel resistors, then add them up, then take one over the result. Uh, so that's the, the math is talked about here. And we show examples of also how to work it out if you have a parallel series combination of resistors. And um, so we show the answers of each of these and, and then uh, you know let the students try some on their own. And then in review and practice, we send them back into the chapter to make sure that they are clear on some details. That's the main point of the questions of exercises and projects. And you have, again, in the educator uh, downloads, you will have the other half of these. So essentially I wrote twice as many of these as were needed. They're, they're very similar. Like for example, I did one and two and uh, they're very similar. So for example, I might've said, what property does a voltmeter measure or something like that in the questions, exercises, and projects. Uh, at any rate, they're, they're, they're usually very closely related to the questions that are seen here so that the students um, you know, are not overwhelmed by curveballs. And so those practice questions have practice solutions. Now, before moving on to measuring current, uh, we do a little quick tutorial on um, measurement units and measurement units have symbols and prefixes. And so uh, the SI unit, um, the symbol omega for the ohm, the measure of resistance might end up being preceded by a K for kilo or an M for mega. Um, and uh, that's pretty common. And so we, we talk about each one, we talk about the actual SI units and their metric, pre, or, I'm sorry, so here's SI units. And so we list some of the ones that that might seem familiar. Capacitance is kind of new at this point, but uh, resistance they've done, voltage they've done, current they're about to do, uh, and then frequency and time 
are fairly familiar as as quantities. And so the, so we, sh we show the SI units and, and talk about how uh, there's a quantity symbol, a unit symbol, lots lots of different details about um, SI units and also metric prefix prefixes, those being giga, which you're probably uh, mega and giga are very common in computer terms. Um, and then kilo for a thousand, m for milli, mu for micro, and so on. So they're introduced. And then the procedure by hand of figuring out how many ohms one kilo ohm really is and how many seconds, 20 milliseconds really are. And uh, then there's even a little uh, chalkboard step-by-step step, walking through it, which I'll let you, you know, review at your leisure. And uh, there's also an explanation in there. You know, the, there's a text explanation that is essentially, if I were lecturing, I'd probably be saying roughly what's in the text as I was writing this on the chalkboard. Trying to help out teachers who may not have had electronics experience, just making sure that, that there's full support or as much support as we can supply. Um, then in order to hit some computer science check boxes, we have projects where um, metric values are converted. And so um, this is actually kind of a cool script. Let's go ahead and run this one. Let me make sure I've got this, yeah. Okay, so this script is going to be one where you can, um, I hope it's not too long. So you'll enter a quantity, a metric prefix, and a unit. And we're, we're using OHM to spell ohm because I didn't want to uh, have to do a comparison. You know, there's no real key for omega. <laughs> so let's see here. Um, go ahead and paste this into y'all to try it out. Chat. Paste. Okay, I want to disconnect my cyber scope. And then connect my and paste over flash. open serial, and then we can enter a quantity. So I'll say two metric prefix. Let's do mega. Well, that's milli shift M for mega and enter the unit. Ohm. And so now we have our 2 million ohms. One, two, three, four, five, six zeros. Yes, 2 million. And then if we want to do 20 thousandths of a second or 20 milliseconds, which actually is setting us up for quantities used a little further down the road. And lowercase m for milli. The SI unit is lowercase s for seconds. And then, um, so 20 milliseconds converts to 0.02 seconds. All right, uh, did that work for y'all? I'll let you go with it a little longer. <laughs> One thumb up, two thumbs up. Thank you, David and WB. Three, Chad, good job. All right, Stephen or Stefan, I'm not sure. Okay, now we're getting lots of thumbs. Good job, everyone, thank you. So again, this is uh, these are applications of what we did on day one when it comes to basic coding. Like you'll notice that we have an if <laughs> comparison. We have um, we have actually some uh, some additional. The double star was was not explained in the initial tutorials, but. Uh, you can tell from here that that's, for, you know, using an exponent, we're actually doing the absolute value 
Um, and that's because we're we're a little further down the road at this point. So this stuff has been uh, introduced along the way. And then we also have uh, one where it, it takes you the other direction. And uh, basically given, um, given a quantity, how would you convert that to, to a metric prefix? And so we have 38,000, which ends up becoming 38 kilohertz, and then 0. 0.000010 uh, farads, which gets converted to 10 microfarads. And again, the chalkboard stuff, penboard stuff, and then a, um, a script to do some of those conversions for you. Review and practice solutions. And again, this is the student's half for practice, and then you'll have half for tests and exams and lab and et cetera. Last but not, or second to last, but not second to least, uh, measuring current. Current is another one where the voltage is the easiest of them all. Uh, current you actually have to insert your current measurement device into the circuit. So we're actually breaking apart the circuit. So it shows how um, basically uh, I, I skipped a part, measure current. So that the circuit ends up being modified to have a small value resistor added right here. This is a 20 ohm red, black, black resistor. And it essentially is placed across the two uh, original three pin headers that you use to have your clips for measuring voltage. But now with this here, this becomes our small resistor that we can measure the voltage across and the amount of current that flows through it determines the amount of voltage that's measured across it. And so that's how an ohmmeter is created. And then uh, the details of both the, the I'm, I'm sorry, an ammeter, a resistance or amp meter uh, is created. And the details of, of, of that script wise are hidden in the um, cyberscope module that is part of the, um, is part of it. And so when we look at the script for this, um, it's, well, first of all, it's just downloaded. Whoopsie. Okay. Copy link. Copy link address. Okay, we'll go ahead and, no, I have to download it. There we go. Measure current. Save link as. When you have a chance, we do have questions. Okay. We'll, we'll, I'll look in just a second. Yep. There it is. Save link as. Mm -hmm. Save. Okay, and then we can look at that in the Python editor. Close serial, drag and drop. So the program up top is quite simple. We import multimeter and then basically repeatedly just set, call the ammeter function, which is part of the cyberscope uh, or the multimeter module, which again is added to our project right down here. But that was all taken care of in the download. Okay, let me go take a look at the questions. Yep. This one was sent just to me. It um, says, I have my board set up with a picture schematic in the homework email with the red, yellow, and green LED lights and push buttons. But the code you just copied and pasted doesn't work. Should I have the breadboard set up like the homework or like what you're displaying right now? Uh, no, no, leave, leave your board like it is in the homework. I'm just talking about these. I, I just uh, basically, we measured voltage and your board is currently set up to measure voltage and that's correct. That's what we want. Um, and so 
in, in order to get through all the material, what I'm doing is just kind of giving you a real quick look at the other things that are available. I encourage you to go through them, you know, at, at your leisure while not in the course. We'll never, you know, it, there, there's just too much material to go through in six hours. So I kind of wanted to give you an overview and also highlight some of the important points, like primarily how the circuit has to change when you're taking different measurements and also the procedure of taking the measurement. So that was when I was talking about the resistor has to be removed from the circuit before you can measure it. And in this case, how the ammeter has to be connected into the circuit in series in order to get a valid current measurement. And so under the script and tests, so that, that hopefully answered that question. Uh, so yes, leave your, no, no need to make the changes to the, to the board that I was talking about. Um, but yeah, if you run the program, you won't get good data until you do make the changes to the board. But we want to avoid that both for time and because we want to be able to measure voltage near the end of this session. Okay, so let's see. Uh, to print omega, um, print and then omega in uh, quotation marks. Yes, that will work. Uh, I agree. Um, so what what uh, what he's saying here is that you know we can say print. Whoopsie, get my hands on the keyboard properly. Print, and then if you've been around doing this for a while, you'll know that if, with a ten key you can hold out Alt two three four. Oh, that's right. I'm in. I'm in Mac. I don't know how to do it in Mac. Nope. Okay, yeah, I was using a Windows trick. Um, but but yes, you, you can uh, copy and paste the Omega in. So for example, I'm going to copy and paste it from the chat. However, the reason that I don't have the students doing that, so there's Omega, and yes, it'll print, but I don't, you know, as an example, I don't know off the top of my head how to print Omega with the Mac keyboard. I'm sure it's pretty easy. I just don't know it. And so I wanted to save students, you know, looking for it. And so uh, so we just had them type in OHM instead of the Omega symbol. Um, because I didn't want to, I didn't want to add to the confusion there. Um, but yes, in the text, we, <laughs> we try wherever possible to use the Omega symbol properly. And that was typed on a Windows uh, machine where Alt and then 234 on the uh, 10 keypad will result in Omega appearing. Uh, let's see here. Who else? Is that all the questions, Stephanie? Yep. Uh, okay. Yep. And we got to thank you for the reply. Right. So it made sense. Oh, good. Good, good, good. All righty. So we got a few more minutes before the break. Let's see if we can get through the, um, the measurement overview. Um, so uh, back to measure voltage, I think something that I forgot to mention was that uh, in the how it works, I forgot to go to how it works. I'm sorry about that, everybody. So this was something this was one of those read this during the homeworks, and it was from electrical measurements. And this talks about Kirchhoff's voltage law, which was, you know, I, I demonstrated it. I, I took the measurement of 3.3 volts across the supply and then measured the voltage drop across each of the elements in the circuit. And then we did figure out that, yes, the, the voltage across the components equals the voltage across the supply or the voltage across the, the elements of the load in series equals the voltage across the supply. So that all worked and it proved Kirchhoff's voltage law. Okay, now going back to measure current, um, after measuring current, which is um, again, as you're, as you're doing the measure current circuit, what you'll have to do is add that, um, add that resistor, but we're not gonna do it we're just going to add the resistor, um, is see right here. Okay, right. So we added the resistor and we still have our light circuit. But in order to add the ammeter, we actually have to break apart the light circuit. So now the light won't stay on. But the light circuit is broken apart. And then note that 
when we when the alligator clips are added the alligator clips are added so that the current goes through the resistor through the led and then all the way here through the red alligator clip to p2 through the small resistor out the black alligator clip and then winds its way back to ground. So that, that is how um, an ammeter measurement is taken. Now, the main difference is that uh, if you have a physical ammeter, you don't have to actually build a circuit to measure current. You can just you know set your ammeter to measure current. Um, but uh, having that extra piece of equipment can be uh, expensive and prohibitive for some or, you know, the cheapo ones aren't very precise. Uh, this is an incredibly inexpensive way to add uh, an ammeter uh, or a complete multimeter to your, to your electronics kit without having to have the physical piece of equipment. So we wanted to make, you know, wanted to try to make this available to as many types of classes as possible. And uh, so let's see, script and tests. So uh, what, this, what, this, what the tests do is they use different resistors. And as you increase the value of the resistance that you're measuring, the current passing through the circuit will drop. And then we talk about how it works and how we're using a very small resistor, relatively speaking, um, to measure the current that's passing through the light circuit when you put those alligator clips, as I just talked about. Okay, last but not least, Ohm's law. Um, so Ohm's law is we've measured and quantified three different properties, voltage, current, V is for voltage, I is for current, R is, or is for resistance. Uh, in many textbooks, E for electric potential, electromotive force is used in place of V. Um, so V equals IR is uh, Ohm's law. And using algebra, we can rewrite that in three different ways. And so this chapter, or this activity takes us through how to figure out um, your voltage if you know the resistance and current, or how to figure out the current if you know the voltage and the resistance. And this one is actually kind of a big deal because what it means is you don't necessarily have to break apart your circuit and insert the ammeter. And so it, it, this chapter talks about that, how, hey, if, if you just, if you, if you know the resistance, you measure the voltage, you can figure out the current passing through the circuit, done, no ammeter needed. Um, and so we, we talk about that. We, uh, uh, now the script and tests are just um, conversions using Ohm's law. And, um, and we have the students do several different ways of, of solving um, and so, uh, in this case, um, what we're doing, well, this is just, uh, how to remember, like, if you remember V equals I times R, you can divide both sides by R to get current or both sides by I to get resistance. And so this is just showing how to, how to use a little bit of algebra and only remember one thing, um, about Ohm's law and, uh, lots of, calculations and examples, and then also um, a, uh, a challenge to the students to, um, to enter uh, a voltage and current measurement, um, and then it calculates resistance. And, and the, the scripts in this, in this activity uh, make all the different versions of Ohm's law here. And with that, let's go ahead and take a five minute break and then we'll uh, go to um, some hands on where we're going to uh, look, go through the applications in two chapters and uh, talk about what gets introduced. We'll be keeping the recording on during the break, just a heads up. Okay, 
So five minutes, it's four o'clock California time. So please try to make it back by 4.05. I'm also going to take a break. We'll be right back.
Uh, so it turns out if you have a Mac, um, Alt Z is o, uh, Omega. Or pardon me, Option Z on the Mac. Let me make sure that's right. Yeah, Option and Alt are kind of, yeah. So there's our Omega character. <laughs> Thank you, Amy, <laughs> for the omegas. Ah. Yes, so here is for the Mac users, option or alt ZZZ. Andy, do you have time for a question? Yes. If your circuit board is to have a blinking light, you would need some code to make that happen. Indeed you would. Circuit, yeah, so if a circuit board was just to have a steady light, would code also be needed? In many cases, yes. Um, the The reason, I mean, normally I'd say yes straight off the bat, but um, I have to look and see if some of the microbit IO pins are defaulting to output high. Um, if that's the case, then you could actually just plug it in with no script. Um, I don't know if I can get there quickly enough. Let's see. Um, yeah, I was just trying to uh, look for the quickest test that a student could do just to check to see if things were working. Um, let's see here. Okay, so I'll paste this in. You can check and see if anybody defaults to output high by reading this uh, page. I don't want to go through the whole thing right now. Chat. And I'll have to background process the, uh, the question about what the most simple test would be uh, to make sure that the micro bit is working. I mean, really, it's just, you know, run the default program <laughs> to, to have it smile. Paste. Okay, so that, that is, um, that's where uh, you would find whether or not there's, um, so the simplest program would be something along the lines of, um, Pin right digital. Okay, uh, let's see. Pin thirteen dot right digital of one. Okay, and I'll want to swap out. My. So let's take the micro bit out of this board. Plug in the one where I did the homework with you guys. There we go. And so P13, I can't remember whether P12, P14 or P13 was the first circuit we created. I'll, I'll, we'll come back around to that shortly. Uh, but let's just say it was P13. Um, so this script would allow you to flash to turn a light on. There we go. I'll paste that into. Okay, I'll 
give it a name to, uh, let's see, P13 light on. Copy, pasting into chat. So you can try that and that should turn your light on. Um, there are other microcontrollers where they have a, a built-in light and um, certainly the microbit has a whole bunch of built-in lights, but to make sure that um, to, to, to build a simple circuit and connect it to the microcontroller, um, the way we address that in the textbook is that there, there are two steps. One is to, one was earlier, we started with this circuit. And if you're skipping all of the information in the, the measurements and units, which a certain percentage of classes will want to do that, uh, then basically the next thing you run into is that you're starting here with with connecting and blinking a light, and you're starting with the light on that you're using to check the wiring of your power. Okay, so that this, this, you know, this this thing's function, aside from being an excuse for a number of lessons, is to check the power to make sure it's wired correctly. Now, so this is the circuit that we left off, either building the breadboard and skipping measurement units, or the circuit that we left off and are going to restart with after doing measurement units. And so what we do is we unplug one end of the resistor and connect it to P14. Then we run a real quick script to make sure that the circuit still works. And we'll have you guys try that script right now. Bob, I think your question kind of led in sort of nicely to what we were just about to do. So there is the script. So that's the, ne the next step is, is in, instead of testing your hardware, now we're testing the system, including the microbit. And you might not see this light going on and off if, for example, the microbit is not plugged all the way into the adapter. If it's not making the electrical connection here, it wouldn't get over to the light. Um, also, if the resistor was not plugged uh, firmly into that P14 socket, uh, and that's P14, on the edge IO adapter. Right here. Oh, I apologize. Yeah, it's P14. Going to that yellow light, which was a green light, I believe, in an in the uh Let's take a look. I think we started out as just a green light. Yeah, so we started out with a green light. We connected it to P14, ran the script, and made some adjustments to the script, made it basically, uh, if you look at the script, we can make it blink twice as fast by reducing the sleep by half. So from 500 to 250, if we flash that, then we get the light turning on and off more quickly. I hope that's, is that still visible? Can you guys see the light turning on and off on my screen? Okay, great, great, thank you. And, uh, All right, so let's see here.
so a reminder, uh, especially for those of you who are watching this on YouTube to get caught up uh, because you were unable to attend today. Um, we're following the links on these three slides, which are currently slides 32, 33, and 34. So slide 32 was the measurements, and now we're in the light blinking, and we're currently at script and tests. Now, if we were to go here from the beginning, we'd start at learn.parallax.com, find what's a microcontroller with Python on the micro bit, go to LED lights, and then um, here's the intro page. And then this is the first activity, connect and blink a light. And at the beginning of the first activity, we have that circuit modification that I just went over. And you can hit next page to go to script and tests. And this is where we are now. And then the how it works, uh, there's a lot of different ways to look at this. So um, we're starting here uh, at the point where we hit while true. And uh, basically, the light by default is going to be off. So it's connected to ground. But this time, the micro bit is connecting P14 to ground. And then our circuit has the light connected to ground on the other side. So there's no electrical pressure across the circuit because the voltage is zero volts at both ends. So the light stays off. Then when the script advances to pin 14 dot write digital of one, what happens is that inside the micro bit, it connects its P14 pin to 3.3 volts. So we have 3.3 volts, which comes out here at P14, you know, from the micro bits edge adapter through or edge through the edge adapter through the board to P14. So now we have 3.3 volts right here. And uh, now we do have electrical pressure because we still have zero volts on the other end. And so current flows through the circuit. Uh, when you go through and measure this, you'll actually find that it tries to apply 3.3 volts, but the micro bit doesn't quite have enough oomph for that. So it's a little bit less than 3.3. I think it's actually clear down at 2.8 when you measure it. Then there's a sleep, which lasts for two and a half seconds. And during that two and a half seconds, since the light was set on, it stays on. Then we get to write digital zero. Whoopsie. So when we make the transition between the sleep and write digital zero, the light turns off. And then we have another sleep for two and a half seconds, and then the light comes back on again. So this, this example is using 2,500 milliseconds or two and a half seconds. And uh, so that's essentially what these two paragraphs say regarding the, uh, the visual here. So there's a lot to think about. Oh, and incidentally, one thing I forgot to mention is that we also show it in schematic form as it's going through and making the high and low on and off. Because a lot of times what students tend to forget is that by writing these scripts, they're actually changing the way the circuit works with the help of the micro bit. Okay, are there any questions on that before I move on? I guess the last thing I should mention, by the way, is that we also have a binary one for on and a binary zero for off. So that's that's another part of um, 
the the lesson of of turning a light on and off with the micro bit. And I see we have a contribution from Jeff. Okay, so Jeff is uh, Jeff is showing you what you can do with all your lights, and there may have been a request from that. I think Amy started with. Uh, you guys having are her, of me having her LEDs blink alternate, alternately. Aha. Mm -hmm. And shared that code. Uh, and then students Jeff is are running his amok code. again. Hey, if they're passing notes, at least it's code. <laughs> this is good. You know, that, that really is good. That really is good. Instead of passing notes about playing a trick on the teacher. <laughs> All right. Well, good job, everyone. So, um, yeah. Now, uh, what I want to emphasize, though, is that at this point in the student lessons, all we have is our one light. So that won't work for the students at this point. They're, they're going to go through, they're going to run the script and tests. They're going to find out, you know, how it works. Uh, they're going to learn about on-off signals. On-off signals have, have property um, such as duty cycle or well, such as period, which is the high plus the low time. Frequency, that's actually one over the period or the number of times per second it repeats. We have duty cycle, which is the relationship of the time the light is on compared with the total on off time. So you could have a very brief on time and a very long off time and you would have a duty cycle that is, you know, if, if the on and off time are the same, this will be 50%. Uh, you could have it be only 20%, in which case it would blip briefly and then stay off for a longer time. And then we have review and practice and solutions again. Let's try setting the brightness on P14. Okay, so this is going to set very dim. Uh, eighth power, quarter power, half power, and full power. There is the script. Uh, and a quick reminder that we're in LED lights, uh, set brightness, script and tests. I'll go ahead and paste in just so, uh, so you know where we are. Um, Actually, also for those of you following along, that's going to be set brightness with a script, script and tests. So you can get to it from the slide most conveniently if you're following along on YouTube. Oops. Gonna need to copy it out of the, uh, the chat myself. Okay, so it's off. So here is one eighth power, quarter power, half power. Yeah, it's not rendering at all well on the um, on the screen. Wonder if I go up a little bit if we'll get any kind of view of it. There we go. Eighth power, quarter power, half power, full power pretty faint but it should be it should be very clear as you're looking at your own leds how's it look for all of you okay and it'll be even more clear if you look at it from the top so uh <laughs> camera notwithstanding if you're looking at it directly over the top of the dome it'll be most visible in person And so this takes us to the concept of D to A or digital to analog conversion, where you have a number like 128. That's actually 128 10 twenty-fourths, and uh, or 256 10 twenty-fourths. So That's a quarter power. 512 10 twenty-fourths, 10 23 10 twenty-fourths is the highest you can get with right analog. But if you want to do the 10 24 10 twenty-fourths. You can do it like so.
So essentially, pin 14, write digital of one would be 1024, 1024. So if you really wanted that last final increment of additional voltage, because D to A converters and A to D converters, the most common ones at any rate, don't actually do the full scale. They only go up to, um, to one step below the full scale. In this case, the full scale is 1024. Okay, uh, on, on digital and off, does it default to full power? Yes, yeah. So basically, right digital of one would be equivalent to the doesn't exist right analog of 1024. 1023 is your top value. Okay, moving along. Now we have the add a light. And so then there's two lights. And I'm not sure how much I want to talk about this because um, basically uh, we're very methodical about walking the students through and having them blink the two lights and then having them and then challenging them to blink the lights alternately. We have a question. Okay. On digital on and off, does it default to full power? Yeah, I just answered that. Uh, okay. um, so sure. yeah, th that's when I was talking about the right analog of 1024 does not exist, but that would be full power. Mm -hmm. And so if you really want full power, you would use right digital of one. Okay. And, um, and although in theory, we think about this as portions of 3.3 volts. Um, sure, the microbit tries to apply portions of 3.3 volts, but when we put these circuit loads on it, um, it can't always keep up. And so if you get, get back around and measure this, you might see that it's closer again to like 2.8 volts. And the reason I mention that is because your students will ask, and it is also in the text uh, that is discussed during the measurement part of it. Okay, so let's try sequential blinks. Okay, so this is sequential blinks. There we go. Okay, so for this one, uh, when you paste it into your browser, open a new pat, uh, open a new tab and paste it into your browser. I'll show you how to do this. So just hit the plus tab, paste the link I'm going to paste to you into your browser or paste and go. And you're going to see that Google Drive is going to tell you it can't display the hex file. So you can download it. Then go back to your um, Python editor and drag and drop the file you just downloaded into the Python editor. And it'll open it for you and you'll have a sequential blinking example. Actually, I could just paste it in now, but after having said all that, let's make sure you can do it. We'll need that for later anyhow. So go ahead and try opening it that way. We'll need that for when you have a module. And remember, we only have, the students only have two lights built at this point. So they're just sequentially blinking two lights. So I would like you guys to try 
this example of lists. So here is where, uh, you know, one of the spots where we add in a, a computer science concept uh, before it's needed. And that is the concept of lists. In um, other languages, you will see them referred to as arrays. Uh, lists have a few more powerful features than your plain old array. Uh, let's see here. Paste. So there is your list program. And this is one where you're not actually going to see the light yet because we're just talking about the idea of lists. And so the colors are going to display in your serial terminal. So were you all able to download and open that hex file? Got a nod, good. Thumb up, yes, another yes nod, excellent. Okay, ah, and some thumbs up now, clicking the... the uh... Clicking the reactions button, I believe. I don't have that as a presenter right now. Is it the reactions button you guys use to get your thumbs up? Yes, thank you, Amy. Okay, it is. All right. Now, um, so now that the students have tried out lists, uh, we talk about how it works. And this is another one where I kind of set up an animated GIF that actually um, takes you through. I didn't mean to open a new window. Let's try that again. New tab. So this, this takes you through, okay. When you have a list and it has things in between the, um, the square brackets, uh, each one of those has an index value. And this is what the text below the animation or the text by the animation, I forget what, whether it's below or above says, index starts out at zero. Since the variable index is zero, that means it's going to go to C list of zero. C list of zero sends back green, and then green gets copied to color. And you can go through step by step and see this printed out on the screen. There's the pause, add one to index, make sure the index has not uh, exceeded the length of the list. Since it is not, it's going to skip back up to the beginning. And then it'll go through. Now index is one. So C list of one is yellow. Yellow gets sent back and then copied over to color. And then we print the color. And it continues that way, uh, going through all the different uh, pieces of the list. So um, there's a lot of different ways you can do this. I remember, I think Sylvie mentioned. Uh, I forget, it might have been Sylvie or Bob. You guys, I think, were uh, at this before. And uh, you mentioned that you can just um, make a list of pins. And uh, so let's see here. Yeah, so this is just a modified list. Um, but there is one here where the lists are incorporated into to making a sequence of blinks. And I think we start out with, um, yeah, I think that there was something where where green was made equal to pin pin thirteen and or red was made e yeah, green was made equal to pin thirteen, yellow was made equal to pin fourteen and and 
uh, red was made equal to pin 15, and then the pin list had red, yellow, green still. Uh, so that is another way to do this. So this is one where we're using the list of pins and essentially um, it goes through each pin in the pin list and sets pin first to 13, then to 14, then to 15. And, uh, and so this is kind of an interesting introduction to auto enumeration because we're not even doing any number crunching. We're just saying four pin in pin list and trusting Python to crawl through here and get all the members, um, but not go over and try to go for a pin 16 that's not there, stuff like that. So, there's that. I pasted the, the script in. And so now we can see the sequence. And instead of having all three, so, so let's compare that to, um, to the earlier example that was pasted in by an attendee. Um, yeah. I am copying a portion of what was pasted in. So com the the, uh, the goal here is again to um, to try to make it so that students uh, know a better way. So and in, in, so you can save code space and have a more compact program. So this this would be the first way that a student would write it. And so that's when we were doing two lights. We, we did something similar to this. And here, when we have three lights and we might have to go to a very large number of lights in some other application, the students get to see how to use a for loop with automatic enumeration to just crawl through their list and make each one turn on and off. So, um, so that's one of the computer science concepts that is salted in uh, along the way. We also have um, measuring the, oh, uh, did somebody have a question? Let's see. So we don't need the alligator clips for any of these programs, correct? That is, well, <laughs> it's interesting that you should ask that just at this moment. Um, we did not need the alligator clips for any of these programs until we start measuring what's going on with the, uh, with the um, with this blinking light. And there's two ways to measure it. One is with a voltmeter and another is with a device called an oscilloscope. And this is setting the groundwork for um, later activities. And so we'll start by measuring with a voltmeter. So we have somebody who is unmuted and I can hear some, something like a radio or a TV in the background. If you have a radio or a TV playing, could you mute yourself? I think you were just muted yourself, thank you. Okay, so now um, we are going to need those um, those probes, and we'll actually have to connect the probes now. Now again, don't unplug a bunch of stuff. Uh, let's let's go ahead and probe our lights.
Um, I'll paste this in so you can connect your probes uh, across the LED. So it's at the near the near the near the bottom of the page. It's going to show where to connect your probe. And then I'll put in the script and tests for the voltmeter. So you want to right click and download um, save link as and you'll download voltmeter.hex. And we're gonna take a look at the alternating 2.65-ish or zero volt levels. Save link as. Drag and drop it into the Python editor. And wait for it to load. It did load. Okay, then remember um, that you want to flash, then disconnect, then go to cyberscope.parallax.com. I'm pasting that one into the chat. Oh, I chatted somebody directly, apparently. Pasting it in again. Okay, and um, hit connect on your cyberscope, select your micro bit. And then um, what we want to see is we want to see the um, when the light's on, it gives us, well, here's the light off, and we have almost zero volts. And then when the light comes back, oh, I'm sorry, forgot to. Uh, to connect my uh, my probes. So red lead goes to P13. Black lead just goes on one of the blue on a socket by the blue stripe. And hopefully you can see now the light comes on, I get 2.7 volts. The light goes off, I get zero volts on 2.7, off zero. So that's one way to look to, to measure the light on off. You guys all got that? Not yet, okay. I'm seeing some who've got it. One head shake, more thumb, one more thumb, two more thumbs. Three, four, okay, good. Guys are starting to get it. Get it now. I see a not yet. I will wait. So this is the voltmeter, very important. And uh, what I'd like to do is show you um, the oscilloscope measurement of this next. Uh, the circuit is unchanged. Jump straight to the script and tests. I'll paste this in so we'll have you. Okay, so um, we're going to um download the uh the script named led blink with plot i'll uh i'll copy that in okay now um 
I think I see a question about getting 2.7 on and zero off. And again, that is because the microbit tries to apply 3.3 volts, but because its IO pin drivers does, does not quite have that much oomph to supply the current through the LED, what you see is 2.7 instead of 3.3. All right, and I just pasted in the oscilloscope script. And so, uh, or the, the page with the oscilloscope script. So you're gonna right click and select save link as. I'm doing it a little differently just so I can get it on a different screen. Oops. Okay, save link as. And save. Go to your uh, Python editor, drag and drop the hex file you just downloaded into the Python editor, connect, flash. Disconnect. Then go to Cyberscope. I forgot to disconnect. So um, if you have any trouble loading, if you have any trouble flashing this latest example, make sure to hit disconnect on your Cyberscope. Then go back to your Python editor, connect, flash, and then disconnect. Then go back to your Cyberscope, hit connect. Select your micro bit, and it should start showing the high low values. Notice that the highs come at about 2.7 volts, and the lows are down to zero volts. That's the left side. And then the uh, number of milliseconds that have elapsed are along the bottom. So now what I'd like you to do is change the time per division down to 250 milliseconds. And then try 500 milliseconds. Notice that the width of the little square wave as we call it in electronics, the width of the high signals change as does the um, time axis along the bottom. And then the voltage axis above the side has not changed yet. Question for you. Yes. Is it typical to be able to flash on the Python editor without disconnecting from the cyberscope? Um, it's, I should say it's not uncommon. <laughs> But I have seen computers where it just does not let you, you know, only one can be connected at a time. Um, I'm not sure what the mechanism is there. So let's, uh, let's change this, this sleep to say 300 and then reflash. Uh, if, you're, if, if you're able to not disconnect, then great. But if it, if it hiccups at you, then go ahead and disconnect the cyberscope flash, then disconnect the... Uh, it is important to disconnect the, the um, Python editor. I have seen some kind of weird data. So what you're going to start seeing now is that the... Uh, that it kind of marches across the screen that you don't necessarily, there, it shouldn't necessarily, you don't necessarily see a rising edge at the same time 
each time the screen refreshes. So here are the rising edge, the first rising edge is at 500, but the next time through, the first rising edge is kind of closer to 750, maybe 800. And in signals with the oscilloscope, that can be that can end up being very confounding. So there's a there's this really cool thing called trigger. And we can set the trigger to rise. And when you do that, there's going to be a long pause because the oscilloscope is going to be buffering your data and looking for a complete image that aligns with the purple vertical line that appeared when you set the trigger to rise. And so now it's going to just stay with this. And you can even um, move that rising edge to a different location. And you will again see your plot think for a while and then line up with that vertical rising edge. There's also a voltage value that you can change. But with an on-off signal, that doesn't have much of an effect. You'll see that later on when we give it an analog signal that varies with time. All right. Um, so that's just a kind of a quick intro to oscilloscopes. There's a there's a few more things that are done. We we really speed up the signal and you know use a, a much finer time increment um, in the activities. But uh, in the interest of time, let's uh, let's move on. Unless there are any questions, I should probably field any questions that we have before we move on. You guys okay? So what do you think? $20 microbit for oscilloscope lessons? I think it's a great value. <laughs> Most oscilloscopes, if you're equipping your classroom, uh, they usually come in at about four to 500 bucks for uh, the inexpensive ones. So um, so this is nice. Of course, it's not nearly as, as capable as those four to $500 oscilloscopes, but it does give the experience and will hopefully prompt some students and give them an interest in electronics. Last but not least, we have push buttons. Um, and I'm going to skip the very methodical step-by-step. -step. We do one push button, test it, do another push button, test it. And so um, I will talk about so let's let's do um, button control, and then I'm going to back up and talk about a couple of other things. But uh, but here is two button control. Oh, this one's fun. Um, this will make the buttons rotate. So this is your turn on two button control. So I'm going to give you guys a Google Drive link because, uh, by the way, another feature. Uh, that we try to incorporate into all these activities is that, yeah, we start the students out in script and tests with something that works. So it works straight out of the box. But when it comes to uh, a try this, we want them putting their hands on the keyboard and actually writing the code. So instead of giving them pre-written code, we give them a screen capture. Due to time constraints, I'm going to give you pre-written code. Uh, let's see here. So that would be 13. No, I'm going to do two button control. That's going to be 14. So we'll copy that link and paste it into you guys. And then I'll paste it into my browser as well. And again, it's going to take you to Google Drive. And then you'll hit the little download arrow in the upper, or the little download option. And it will download the buttons for you. The buttons, uh, what's it called? Buttons make LEDs rotate. And then connect, flash. Okay. 
and disconnect. So I just jumped kind of over the entire push button chapter. Um, and I will try to highlight a couple things in the remaining few minutes. But first of all, I wanna make sure you guys all have this up and running. And what you can do is press and release the upper button. And if you do it fairly rapidly, um, it'll only increment by one light. So each time you press, and I'm pressing the upper button. And so the, uh, so the, the light travels in an upward rotation. If I press the downward or the lower button, then we get the lights in a downward rotation. And by the way, the, um, there are some uh, assigned experiments to make a fully actuated street light using the buttons and the red, green, and yellow lights. So let me know when you've got that tested and hopefully working. One, two thumbs so far, three, four, five. Wow, okay. Proficiency is, is skyrocketing. Great job, everyone. Okay, I think I see a question in the chat. Okay, so there's a question. My lights are rotating without any button pressing. That points to a possible circuit error. <clears throat> um, so the first thing to check is, first of all, are these resistors on the right brown, black, orange, gold? Or, a, so or reverse in the logic. Oh, so I see one. Oh, I see. I forgot the two resistors on lines 21 and 25. Yeah. So those are 10K resistors. They're brown, black, orange. And um, so we'll go ahead and get with you guys on the troubleshooting uh, segment after the recording ends. I'm going to real quick just talk about a couple of things regarding the push buttons. Um, so in the build and test the push button, uh, again, it's very methodical and step-by-step -step where you start with one and you do some tests and, and, um, and the script and tests, we actually press the button and we get to see the state either being zero or one. And if I'd have not skipped this, we, um, we would have caught this error. Oh, good, but I'm glad you're both working now. So with the students, I wanna emphasize that, again, this is very step-by-step. -step. We're isolating each thing as we add it. So we're adding one push button to begin with. And we start out as usual with the, the part in the schematic symbol. And then here is the, be careful when you insert it. And then here is the full diagram. And note that the, uh, I made the, um, I set some translucency on the two lights that we're not using because I don't want students pulling them out. Um, so this is, this is the circuit we're focusing on, even though we have kind of a few more elements from earlier activities in that circuit. And so then we have the script and test in the script. I'll just paste this in and you guys can try it. Uh, the main thing is you'll, for this one, you'll go to your terminal and you'll press and hold uh, the P6 push button, that is the uh, lower of the two push buttons. And when you press and hold it, you're gonna see ones appear. And when you release it, you'll see zeros appear in the, uh, in the terminal. If you have any weirdness to your terminal, go through, we wanna leave the, the micro bit connected. We wanna disconnect the cyber scope for this. Uh, then 
if you go to open serial, um, so I'm getting zeros, but then when I press and hold the lower push button, it gives me ones, let go, and we get zeros again. And this is important from the, again, the association between binary values and the relationship of circuits. Uh, we also have something that talks about the voltage behavior of, of a push button circuit because it can be somewhat confounding. I, I remember uh, actually as an engineering student and an electronics engineering student, the first time um, I was presented with a push button and asked to explain how it worked, uh, smoke blew out of the sides of both ears because <laughs> it was, uh, you know, it, 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 there's a lot going on there and uh, we're out of time for today. So I'm going to, uh, I'll just leave this to you for reading uh, at, and just kind of close on the note that um, this is the reverse of an LED light in that uh, when 3.3 volts is applied to an IO pin, that IO pin is listening to the circuit without affecting it. And when 3.3 volts is applied, a binary one is returned by the pin six read digital. Whereas when zero volts is applied, when the, the button is not pressed, uh, it, pin six dot read digital will, will return a zero. And uh, so again, you'll see this in your homework. Quick thing about the homework. What we're going to do is we're going to build the circuit for um, our servo motor. I might actually uh, suggest that you also test it. I'm not sure. Again, I don't like to overload you guys between sessions in a, in a, in a single week. Um, so we might just be building the servo or I might actually ask you to test it. Uh, I'm gonna take a look and, and see how intensive that is. Uh, you'll also be gathering a potentiometer. That's this little twisty knob thing. It's a knob you can twist and, um, and it's called a potentiometer. And uh, so you'll be adding your potentiometer down here and you'll be adding the servo up here, this circuit right here. And uh, so those are the two circuits you'll be adding. And then the, 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 the test is still to be determined. I'll probably have you test something. Um, you'll be connecting the battery and be very careful. Um, you'll want to have the red wire on the left, uh, not, not on the right. I hope I got that right. Sylvia, you were the first one to catch me on this. Um, let's see here. Checking to make sure that I got it corrected. Uh, I think both Sylvia and, oh boy. No, yeah, it's right. It's correct. Okay, so it's correct in this diagram, and I may have to scramble to make sure it's corrected in the um, in the textbook. Uh, so anyway, I will I will send you this. I will send a link to this slide to make sure that you're working from this on the servo and potentiometer connections, and um, and then possibly a few quick tests to run either on your batteries, your servo, possibly both. Uh, again, I'm gonna try to keep it light. And uh, the one other thing we've got going on for homework, and this one is not crucial. If, if you run into any snags, please don't let it become, you know, an additional uh, item of stress during the day. Uh, because we'll, we'll do a show and tell. I won't be asking you to log in and, and get anything from learn.parallax.com, but I want you to, at some point, make sure that, that you can log into learn.parallax.com. If you have never logged into learn.parallax.com before, uh, you'll be getting an activation email that probably resembles this. Uh, and follow the instructions here. You'll actually, you'll also get an email from uh, Stephanie saying that um, that that you got a new learn.parallax.com account and to go in and um, and then check the available resources. So this one is go in, confirm that you're 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 you know you intend to use the learn.parallax.com account and update your password. And then um, here is going to be a thing where 
you're going and just checking the resources. And I'll talk briefly about those resources on Friday, but not ask you to necessarily go in and download them. I'll just show you how. Uh, but we do try to get everybody so that they can get in and get the, um, get the assessment materials, which are uh, locked away from the students. All right, so that's it for today. Um, I, I'd like as many of you to hang out as, as wants to um, talk about stuff. I, I do actually have a couple of overarching questions for you. So if, if we could hang out for just a little while, it's completely optional. Um, I'm just trying to, trying to improve um, what we deliver to you. And so I'll have a couple of questions for after we stop recording. Um, and that's it for today. Thanks for coming, everyone. And we'll look forward to seeing you same time on Friday. Take care. And then for those of you who want to stick around, I have a couple of questions about uh, content delivery.